that working for you? British Prime Minister Theresa May has appointed a Minister for Loneliness. Well, welcome everyone to Foothills Christian Church. If you're here on campus for the first time or kind of a returning newcomer, we're glad that you are here with us. If you're watching online for the first time, uh, we welcome you and we are glad you are here. We're currently in a series called Exposed. I cannot say it like Jesse says it because he just has a certain flair that I do not possess. So, but here at Foothills, our goal is to coach you up in your faith. And one way that we do this is by showing you how to think for yourself. And since this is a series on intimacy, we have to address sexuality as well because they are linked together in the scriptures. And so we've kind of talked in the last couple weeks about why that is. Just a reminder, if you have littles here, you're more than welcome to have them here, but uh, you will also probably have to answer some questions uh, and that is fine because you're the parent. And we're here to support you in what you are doing. My hope is that in this series, you discover some new insights, right? That you have a new way of thinking about this powerful influence in your life, and in your marriage, and or future marriage. And so what we're trying to do is get down to a little deeper level. We don't believe fluff is enough particularly in a society that is so obsessed with just, you know, the basics or the surface. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what happens when intimacy goes wrong and why is it that what is intended for joy can often result in a lot of pain. Now, as we dig in, I want to just give a brief review, and that is, you'll see on the screen, there's over a hundred passages of Scripture in the Bible that directly reference human sexuality. These are direct references. These are not uh, references where it's involved in the story or alluded to in the teaching. Uh, one of the things that's very significant about it is that there's a lot of it, okay? One of the things that we did last week is we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We talked about the introduction of what happened in 5. We talked then about the teaching in 6. And I'd like to pick up where we left off. So let's spend some time there trying to understand what's going on, what he's teaching, and how to apply these biblical principles. So let's just jump in. Let's get started. Turn your Bibles if you have them, digital form, or even in the old fashioned, you know, where they print words on paper and you read it. It's called a book. Um, uh, these, still, these things still exist, you know. But hey, if it's on your iPad or your device or whatever, that's awesome. Uh, brief review chapter, fi uh, chapter five is uh, introduced hey, there's something going on in the church that you're tolerating that you shouldn't, okay? Verse one, and he says, it is somebody is sleeping with his father's wife, okay? And then he talks in verse 6 that the reason why you're kind of prideful about tolerating this, you know, it's like, well, grace covers everything, do whatever you want, he says, is because you've split the spiritual and the physical. And what you're saying is, well, as long as I'm okay spiritually, what I do physically doesn't matter, right? And what he says is, no, you got to realize that sp your spiritual soul in impacts the physical, and what you do in the physical material realm also impacts your soul. So he brings those two back together. And then in chapter 7, what he does is he says, let's talk about marriage. Verse 1, let's dig in, let's get going. Number 1, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, that's the first thing that kind of pops out, is we learn that the Corinthians had written a letter to Paul and asked him some questions. We do not have that letter today, so we don't know what the letter actually said, but we can kind of deduce a little bit about what was in the letter because Paul answers their questions in this letter back to them, okay? And the thing he says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. So the belief is, is that they were basically asking a question saying, 
we're, it's, we're, is this the goal of being a Christ follower, right? To be abstinent and celibate. And they're referring back to Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus starts off by saying, hey, this is the point of marriage is one flesh, what God has joined together, don't separate. And then the disciples in verse 10 say, well, if the marriage relationship is like this, it's better not to get married. So Jesus was raising the bar for the covenant of marriage. And so Jesus in response and he says, well, not all men, all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. And then in verse 12, he says, now there are eunuchs, uh, who were born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. If you're able to accept it, accept it. So Jesus says this basically, if you want to be celibate and abstinent for the sake of the kingdom, and you can live that way, great. And so obviously it seems to me that they wrote Paul and said, is this the goal? And Paul says, well, what Jesus said is a good goal. We're not going to invalidate anything Jesus said. He goes, but, verse 2, look what he says, because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Now, this is a very specific statement. And what he's saying here is this, obviously, is that man and a woman can get married this is an affirmation of uh, not only monogamy, but the notion that you know, polygamy was not the design that God had in the creation event. Okay? Boom. says that very, very specifically. Okay? Now, what's really interesting to me is the statement of because of immoralities. And it's important to note that the word for immoralities is plural. And it covers a whole bunch of different things. The word actually is pornea, which is the first half of pornography. That's where the word pornography, and pornea means a perversion of. And what's really interesting is whenever you hear this word in the Bible or read the word in the Bible, pornea is, is, it's really fascinating because what it is, it has to have something with an original intent that was good, but then is warped or changed or perverted. See, the word perverted is you're taking something good and natural and you're twisting it, right? So like in my life, this would be applicable with it's good to eat when you're hungry, but I have perverted that to always wanting to eat donuts, <laughs> which is not good. That's not healthy, right? So now that's surfacy, but if you really think about this, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper to every level of your soul. And this is where Satan likes to spend his time deceiving you. This is why Paul calls Satan the father of lies, right? It's an issue of deception. So the, the issue here with immoralities is simply that if you want to go kind of figure out what all of they are, you can listen to Salty Pastor uh, episode 405 and 406. But the key point is this, is that if intimacy is your goal, there's really only one path to get there. Your desire for intimacy is good, but Satan spends most of his time trying to get you to divert from that path. G.K. Chesterton used to talk about this. He said, you know what, if you think about it, it is really easy to trip and fall. He says, very easy to trip and fall. You only have to get off, like how far can you lean over before you fall? You think about it. Whether it's four, it's not very far, and then boom, you're off. He goes, there's an infinity number of angles by which you can fall or trip. He goes, but there's only one angle at which you can stand, right, where you're in perfect balance. It takes, what, infants 18 months sometimes to learn this, right, to get their brain to work so that they can stand up and, you know, and I think that's why God has babies, you know, born so short. That's why when they fall, it's no big deal. <laughs> People are like, yeah. I don't think so. Think for yourself. That's my motto. Okay. Now, this is really important to understand uh, is he's saying if your path to intimacy, it's really only one path. Okay. And he just said that in verse two, have your own wife, have your own husband. Okay. Then he says this, <clears throat> this is where it gets really, really dicey. Verse three, let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife. And notice the word must. The husband must 
fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. And then in verse 4, it says, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. Boy, that's a little dicey in today's world, isn't it? You know, what? and what is he actually referring to? I mean, people have tried to dilute and obfuscate, but what he's talking about when you read chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 together in context, in this specific case, he's talking about sexual desire. And what he says here is, you know, in essence, this is... And I want you to catch this. This teaching is most important for all of you who are single. If you're not married, this is very important to understand. And what I want you to understand is that if you're not willing to sign up for this, don't get married. Okay? Don't get married. Because Paul doesn't leave any way to obfuscate this or get out of it. He says, look, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife. And likewise, the wife must also fulfill her duty to her husband because you don't have authority over your own self anymore when you make a covenant for marriage. See, marriage is not 50-50. That's not what he's saying. He's saying it's 100 to 100, right? You have to be in essence, all in. This is not, a lot of people say, well, this is just an invitation for abuse or dysfunction. No, it's not. It is when when practice in the covenantal concept of God's ideal, this person, right, does not have authority over this person. This person doesn't have authority over this person. You see, what it is, is it's a path to intimacy, not dysfunction. It's an invitation to discover God's design. It's not an invitation for abuse, right? If it flows in one direction only, that's where abuse occurs. And you can see this simply by the context, because if you read the last half, we won't be able to get there, of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he gives you all of the basis or the grounds for a biblical divorce, Okay, so we don't have time to go in that. So that's important to understand, that simple concept, is that if you're a woman and you're married, you do not have authority over your body. And men, if you are married, you do not have authority over your body. Okay, when you took a covenant before God, you're you're saying, I want to be all in. I'm going to give myself fully to you. Now, why does he say that? Look at verse 5. Stop depriving one another. What is he talking about? He says, only except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, what he's saying here is if you want to have a path towards intimacy, deprivation is not the answer. He says, don't deprive one another, okay? It doesn't help you become one flesh. So when a married couple, without a medical reason, says, we're going to stop doing this, it creates problems. It doesn't solve anything. And according to Paul, it weakens your relationship and exposes you to temptation. Okay? Isn't that interesting? That's what he is saying. Now, let's go on to verse 6, okay? And this is kind of going to be verse 6 and 7 together. He goes, now, I say this by way of concession, not of command, because I wish that all men were even as I myself am. What does he mean by that? Well, he's single, okay? Right? 
And most scholars believe that he was originally married because that's the only way he could be, be on the Sanhedrin or a Pharisee. You had to be married to do that. And then his wife passed away. And so he is, now he has been a widower uh, when he became a follower of Christ. He says, however, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. So I think Paul, this is another clue that if you look back to verse 1, he is referencing back to chapter 19 of the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus said, if the, relation, the disciples said, if the relationship between the man and the wife is like this, better not to marry. And Jesus says, verse 11, well, not all men can accept this, only those to whom it has been given, right? So it is given as a gift, all right? So I think that's important. He says, then if we go verse 8, now I want to say to those of you who are unmarried and to widows, it's really good for you if you remain even as I. He says, it's a, go ahead and be single. It's good for you. And part of the reason he says that is if you go to verse 26, I don't have it up on the screen, but I want to read it to you. He goes, I think then that this is a good view of the present distress that a man, it's good for a man to remain as he is. So what present distress is he talking about? Well, the Corinthian church was under a lot of persecution and suffering at this time, okay? So what he's saying is he's saying, look, right now the suffering is bad. It's going to get worse. And if you're single, don't seek to get married. If you're married, don't seek to become single. He, he says that in the text. And so he's saying, because the suffering is bad, don't seek to change your status at this time, Okay. Now, some people have gone back and said, look, the reason he said this in verse 7 is, is why if you're really a spiritual person, you're going to be celibate your whole life. If you, people have tried to use this to uh, defend the Roman Catholic celibacy of the priesthood. Uh, if they have reasons for celibacy of the Roman Catholic priesthood, I'm sure they're good, but this verse doesn't teach that. As a matter of fact, because what did I say? You have to read all these verses in context. And what you see is that Paul is very pro-marriage. You read in Ephesians chapter 5, you read in 1 Timothy chapter 3. As a matter of fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says that a sign of the end times and people turn away from the Lord, there will be people who forbid marriage. So Hebrews uh, chapter 13, let marriage bed be honored by all. So it's a, marriage is a great thing to be honored by all. So what he's basically saying here in verses uh, 7 and 8 is he says, look, if you have the gift, that's great. But then notice what he says, verse 9. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, something that's really interesting is that that last prepositional phrase, with passion, doesn't actually exist in the text. It's implied in the usage of the word burn, okay? So let's talk about this just really quick. Uh, two things I want to point out. Number one is, he says, if you do not have self-control. Now, in today's world, we kind of use the term self-control in a manner that makes it negative. And that's not how Paul is using the word. What I mean by that is we use the word today. It's like, well, you know, you don't have any self-control. You know, if I walk into a donut shop, people say in a derogatory way, you know, to try to bring me down a notch, pastor, you don't have any self-control in here. You need to avoid this place. They, that would be accurate. But the way Paul is using this word in this culture at this time, it was a Greek word that was referred to athletes that are in training. Okay? So if you're an athlete in training, what you would do is you would say, I'm not going to eat certain foods because it's going to impact the competition coming up in the near future. I'm going to avoid wine. I'm going to avoid various drink in order to what? Be at my peak physical health. Some places, and this is practiced today, even in college football and other college sports, it says, you know, the coach stands up and says, I don't want any of you guys doing anything sexual 48 hours before the game. Because what they're saying is the competition is the most important thing to win the game, and so you're going to exercise a unique level of self-control, right? 
So he's using it in a positive way. He's not trying to say, well, since you can't get your act together, you know, and you're a weak person, go ahead and get married. Because if you read it that way, what that does is that actually lowers your value of the significance and importance of the covenant of marriage, right? What he's saying is this, is it's better not to burn. What does that mean? Well, if, if marriage is of really high value and it's a gift from God and your sexual drive, your sexual thirst for intimacy is a part of that uh, relationship, that's not a evil thing. That's a healthy thing. It's a wonderful thing, he said. But some people find themselves that they don't have the gift from God to be celibate for their whole life. You know, I remember many, many years ago when I was in college, I met this guy. He was a pastor. He's traveling around. He spoke. He had this insane uh, schedule. And I said, how do you do that? He goes, well, the Lord gave me the gift of celibacy. And he, he wasn't trying to say it as a joke. He was just saying, I do not have a divided attention. I can be on the road 365 days a year, traveling and speaking and doing evangelistic crusades and all that kind of stuff. Because God gave me this gift, right? And so it's really interesting is what he's saying is that if you have a difficulty being alone, that's not a bad thing. If, if you feel that you were meant to be married... That's a good thing, right? And if you are devastated by loneliness and isolation and a lack of intimacy in your life, guess what? That's, God has given you a path, right, to see this drive within you, this desire in you to be fulfilled. The issue is this. Don't fulfill it in the wrong way. So that's the meaning of burning with passion. So let's recap our biblical principles real quick, okay, here. And then I want to kind of show you why we tend to get off track, okay? Our souls are wired for intimacy, Paul says. The evil one knows this because of immoralities, is his quote, right? He presents all sorts of options for us to try and fulfill this thirst of the soul, the reason why they are wrong is because they're perversions. They never work. They never provide what they say they will. Happiness, joy, connection, intimacy, fulfillment. They just don't. Jesus has provided a specific way to meet the desire for intimacy within our souls by giving us the gift of marriage. And the path to intimacy is to be all in, right? The path to intimacy is to be all in on your marriage, which is hard to do if you've been hurt or disappointed or let down in your marriage. But marriage cannot be a 50-50 agreement. It has to be a 100 and a 100 to be all in. But you know what? This is really difficult to do because none of us is 100%. Evaluate yourself real quick. If Billy Graham, I mean, Billy Graham, right? big guy, great leader. If you were to say that Billy Graham, no one's going to say he's perfect, right? Because nobody's perfect. So on a scale of zero to 100%, where would you put him? Would you put him at 80, 85? Uh, let's, let's put him at 86, okay? Where, would, where do you put yourself in comparison to Billy Graham? Right? Well, I, you know, maybe 50%. So maybe 75%. Well, if you're 75% and your spouse is 75%, that gives you 150%. Because 100% and 100% added together is 200%. So that means 50% of or a quarter of your relationship has a lot of holes in it. Okay? So that's called relational math right there. So some of the math people are going, how did you get that algebra to work? Because that doesn't make any sense to me. Okay? Well, what happens is when is that when you first come together, you, your, your, the gaps in your, if you're 75% or 50%, right, that person is your gaps tend to do what? They fit together like gears. But after you've been together for about three years, you know what happens? You start doing this. And this is really hard for women, okay? Because one of the 
basic needs for women is to be, feel safe and secure in the relationship. When you're like, the gears are like this, that woman now has a sense of security on the front and both sides, right? On three sides of her life, of her relationship, she's covered. When she's like this and there's a gap, right, this is friction because it doesn't fit. And guess what? She's totally exposed on the sides. So it's, that's, that's really difficult for women. And so the reason why you go from this to this is, well, let me illustrate it for you, okay? All right, here we go, all right? What they do is women and men tend to withhold. They deprive. Do you need me to help or is, oh, my other helper's coming. So while they're getting ready, we're going to put this thing up on the stage. I'm going to show you. Paul says, stop depriving one another, okay? Deprive, when you deprive, what you're doing is you're withholding, okay? Now, withholding is all about, they built this thing industrial, let me tell you. That is something else. Okay, just set my little guys here. Hand me one of those, thank you, sir. There you go. This is just a lovely young couple and... All right, people are like, what in the world? Oh, this is going to be fun. If it works, it's going to be awesome. But when you're a foothills, like half the stuff I do just never works, right? You have to picture it in your mind. Okay, what does Paul say? Stop depriving one another. If you want to become intimate in your relationship, you have to stop withholding. Because at its core, withholding is about ownership, right? This is mine. I'm not giving it to you unless you fill in the blank, right? So I'm going to withhold. At its core, what this is, is a power play in a relationship. And if you want to be intimate in one flesh in your marriage, you have to understand is that you have to have an emotional connection together, right? You have to have an emotional connection. But what I've seen in some marriages is one of the partners will say, well, you know what? I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert. I just, you know... I could, you know, she has 30,000 words. I have 12,000 words. I've used all my words at work, and I, I'm done talking when I come home. That's called withholding, right? You know, your wife needs to know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. You know, she wants to know what's the internal dialogue going on. And if you go, well, I don't like it. And what I've noticed is that men, right, who are unhappy with their wives do what? Withhold more. They introvert more. They avoid more. Sometimes it's women, right? In the, in the relationship, women will say, well, I, you know, he, he says, here's a perfect example. Honey, are you okay? I'm fine. Okay? That says it all, right? You know, if you want to become one flesh, you also have to have an intellectual connection. Now, this is not an issue of IQ, right? Well, I need to be as smart as she is so we can talk, you know, nuclear physics or whatever. That's not it at all. Intellectual means the things that I think about, the goals that I'm working on, the things that I'm pouring my energy and times towards, we, they have to have alignment. There has to be common goals, like how we manage money, how we're going to raise our kids, where we want to live. These are actually intellectual agreements that you make. That's why when you talk about it, you make intellectual, factual statements. Well, if we live here, the schools are better. If we live there, the neighbors are better. If You see, you're actually making intellectual arguments. Well, I have seen couples withhold each from each other, right? Because they are just not connecting, whether it comes to, well, you do your thing and I'll do mine. You know, I've seen a lot of men say, well, I'll go out and earn the money, but I'm not into the child rearing thing. You know, that's her, that's her thing. You're just withholding, right? Uh, I've seen it vice versa. If you want one flesh and intimacy, you have to have a spiritual connection, okay? Now, what's really interesting is spiritually, you have to develop common beliefs. You have to practice a common faith. I know a lot of people, a lot of men and women have gotten married and either she or him said, well, this is your faith. I'm kind of, you know, in the middle. I'm kind of agnostic, but we'll practice your faith. Then they get married and they have kids and then they go, well, you know what? I'd rather do this on, Saturday, on Sunday morning than go. That's called withholding, okay? 
in sexual intimacy, which is where it really creates fireworks, is people withhold. And if you separate the spiritual from the physical, you get, you, you, you withhold. You know, I know, a, I know a lot of men who, who say, well, I, I just want to have sex with my wife. They say, well, do you communicate with her? <laughs> do you talk? Do you, you know, you realize you're a microwave. You hit the button, you're at 1,500 watt strength, right? She's more like kind of an, a convection oven, you know? You got to turn it on, let it preheat. You got you to gotta just, that's called basic affection. You've got to love her and communicate with her. And he's like, what in the world are you talking about, man? We live in a fast food world. Your wife doesn't. Okay. Now, sometimes it's the other way. I'm obviously speaking in generalities. Think for yourself. Apply these principles for yourself. But the bottom line is, is that sexual intimacy is not just about the sex act. It's about everything that happens around it in the relationship. Because it's a part of, not the culmination of, intimacy. And what Paul is saying is that, guess what? If you are depriving it in any of these ways, it will not work. You will not get to intimacy or one flesh, right? And the main reason why you get to withholding is because of the teeter-totter of relationships, okay? When you first get, first fall in love, you're right, you're very close, right? I mean, it's just such a wonderful time, isn't it? Isn't young love really fun, <laughs> you know? Especially, I'm at the stage of my life now where I've, my, two of my kids are married and it's just like, it's so fun to see them fall in love, you know, and how they sit there and they talk, oh, he's so handsome, dad, you know, and oh, she's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life, dad, you know. I mean, you're just like, that is so awesome. And then you just leave it at that. <laughs> you don't say anything, I just leave it at that. Because what happens in a relationship is because you're not 100%, right? You're really close to a fulcrum. But when you come to an issue that you're not 100% agreement in, right, you don't realize this, but you have spent your entire life up to the point when you got married solving your problems yourself. Your family of origin has taught you how to solve your problems in your way. So you come to a problem right? Let's say a disagreement over where you're going to live, disagreement of taking a job in another state, how many kids you're going to have, how you're going to budget your money. You've always made those decisions. How? By yourself. So you get into a little conflict with your spouse and what do you do? Well, I'm going to solve this problem, right? But what happens? This is very bad in a relationship. This is when you feel like your relationship is unstable. It causes questioning. It causes doubting. This is all subconscious. So in order for you, right, to balance the relationship, it doesn't matter if it's the husband or the spouse, what does this spouse have to do to balance it again? They have to what? They have to move to there. And that brings you back to what? Balance. Then you have another conflict in your relationship, right? And you say, well, what we're going to do is is I'm going to solve it, and this has always worked for me, right? And you talk about it, you argue about it, but in the end, that's what you end up doing. And so what happens to the relationship? Oops. <laughs> and in essence, that's kind of what happens over time. If, you know, five years from now, a hundred different little conflicts that have never been properly resolved put you way out here. This is when you say to your spouse or to your friends, when you talk about your spouse, we're not in love anymore. And the reason you feel that way is because what's between you? All this emptiness. And just like you saw earlier, what happens is eventually this is where it's the most volatile too. The swings in your relationship are, can be way up or way down. And eventually, someone just says, I can't do this anymore. I have to get off. Does that make sense to you? I hope it does. Because this is why 
If you get into a withholding pattern intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, or physically, guess what? It ends up in pulling you apart. And the reason why we do this is because we don't have conflict resolution skills. Everybody says, well, we were never meant to be together. Now, when I was a young pastor, people come and say, I think I married the wrong person. We were never meant to be together. And I would try to help understand and really dig into that. And I go, and I say, look, if, if, if it's not a drug addiction, you know, or a mental health issue or abuse, which 80, 70 to 80% of the time it's not, I said, all you're going to do is take this exact pattern into your next relationships. And that's why second marriages fail at twice the rate of first ones. You see, the issue isn't that you married the wrong person because you loved them enough to get married in the first place. You didn't fall out of love accidentally. It happened because of the fact that you couldn't resolve your conflicts in a way that brought you together instead of creating distance in your relationship. And that is what Paul is offering you. He's saying, don't get on the deprivation teeter-totter. Try and get on a path to resolving your conflicts in a way. It's, a, it's skilled. It's learned. Almost nobody's ever taught it. I mean, very few people have learned how to be married by resolving their conflicts in a way that pulls them together in one flesh. It's not that difficult. As a matter of fact, what I did is I put together a simple skill process that you go through. It's called the conflict resolution skill. It's, uh, you can go to this uh, QR code. You can download it. It'll be on our website, stuff like that. It's got seven steps in it. I like that. I, I, I kind of made it seven steps because, you know, God's number seven. So I just turn, you know, little imagery there. But it's the seven steps of how to resolve conflicts. And this is what I want you to walk away with today, is that God has offered you a path to intimacy. Deprivation is not the path because it opens you up to what? Temptation to the immoralities. The path of coming together and being all in is the path of learning how to resolve your conflicts as a couple and not as individuals. There's an old song by Jackson Brown out there. You may remember it if you're from my generation, where he says, you know, we get into an argument. He's talking about this woman he's in love with. He says, we get into an argument. You win, I win, but we lose. Don't lose because Jesus has a promise for you. Let's stand for closing prayer. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Moms, are you trying to figure out what to do with your children this summer now that they're out of school? Nod your head. I know you all are. We have some amazing opportunities for kids happening this summer. We have um, church camps. We have VBS. There's youth trips. All kinds of fun things that are happening. Make sure you head out to the Connection Point booth and find out what we're offering as a church to help continue your child's spiritual growth over the summer and maybe give you a little bit of a break occasionally. But that's not the primary purpose. We're all focused on spiritual growth. Connection Point Booth is great for all those events. If you're online, you can find those at foothills.org slash events. But just in general, even if you're not looking for your kids, if you want to be connected here, if this is your first time here, or you're just ready to go all in on Foothills, we have a lot of ways you can get involved with small groups, events, serving, and helping make life change here. All of that is available at the Connection Point Booth out there, or you can fill out one of the cards in the backs of the seats, or you can use our app. All of those are great options. We're so excited that you're here. Make sure you have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next week. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the amazing things that you're doing in us and through us. In your name, amen. amen. Have a good week. Also, if you need prayer, the elders are going to be up here um, to pray with you if you need prayer. So please come down if you need prayer. So, so kind to me